Mark Schmeler, and I have the honor of being the, I think they call me the director, but rather the curator of the International Seating Symposium. This is our 31st uh, symposium. Uh, this has been going on since 1984, I believe. Um, and I would like to welcome all of you to Nashville. I know that for some of you, it's been a little bit of a challenge to get here. We've had some unprecedented uh, weather uh, pretty much all over the country and around the world. But glad you made it. This is fantastic. We've got a great few days ahead of us. Uh, we put together a great program. And so, again, welcome. To start out, everybody wants to know what the numbers are. We have, from last Friday anyways, over 2,000 people registered. That doesn't count. <laughs> doesn't count what came in uh, the last few days. So I think, we're, again, another record-breaking symposium. Some things that we did have a little bit of control over, too, is we increased the size of the exhibit hall significantly. We're up to 85,000 square feet. Uh, and 126 ind individual companies represented. So as much as things may seem like they're changing in our industry, maybe not always for the good, uh, but we are growing as a symposium, so I like to use that as a gauge to that we are continuing to make progress. And with that also, we have 140 sessions occurring over the next uh, two and a half days. So good, I wanna thank all of you for being here and making this happen. The countries, again, we're over 35. A lot of you have come back. Um, we're representing pretty much a good part of the world. We put this map together this time. The blue shows the continents and the countries that we're representing. Obviously, North America is, is still well represented. It's Latin America is growing significantly. We have Colombia, Argentina, Brazil as, the, as our our attendees. Europe is, is very well covered also. And I think what's really nice this year too is that a lot of people from Eastern Europe have, uh, have joined the family. Asia has grown significantly and as well as, as Australia and New Zealand. For our new companies, or new countries that I would like to welcome, first time attendance to the International Seating Symposium is a Czech Republic, uh, Mozambique from Africa, Micronesia, Turkey, uh, Republic of Georgia, Spain, and Croatia. So welcome, let's give them a round. From North America, I just wanted to mention that we have seven of the Canadian provinces, um, 49 of the U.S. states. I kept this one slot open here under new countries, but does anybody know someone from Wyoming? <laughs> anybody here from Wyoming? We looked in the database, we couldn't find anybody from Wyoming. If you know somebody from Wyoming, invite them next time. We'll pay for their flight. If not, we might just have to move the ISS to Jackson Hole or Cheyenne. <laughs> All right, well, it looks like Wyoming has mobility sorted out anyways. So. Um, I'd be remiss without uh, taking a moment to acknowledge the supporters. Um, symposiums like this obviously don't just happen, um, and they're not free. <laughs> so uh, our supporters are very important to us, and so our, our platinum supporters this year are, again, our Invicare, Permobile, and, and Quantum. Um, at the gold level, we have Key Mobility, at Silver, Tie Light, and Sunrise and several bronze sponsors. So a round of applause for our supporters. Uh, most importantly is the, the folks involved in actually putting this together. Uh, some people think that the International Seating Symposium, and this is, this is a picture of the Cathedral of Learning at Pitt, thinks that we occupy like four stories of the Cathedral of Learning with staff of dozens and hundreds of people and accountants and attorneys and all of us. It's really just about four or five of us, and this is not even our full-time job. Many of us are, are doing this on a volunteer level, but the main, the main person who pulls this together, and many of you have probably interacted with Linda, Linda Sapansky and Cheryl. They're the ones that... Uh, they're basically our customer service department. 
Uh, Joe Ruffing, obviously, all of, all of the AV here, all of the graphics, all of the PowerPoints, all of the web, the web resources are put together by, by Joe. And then Rich, as, as you know, he, he kind of tags along with everybody and makes sure that the bills get paid and uh, we're all in the right place at the right time. And we've, we've added Vince this year. He's the new guy. Um, so be nice to him. He's about 25 years old. Um, we welcomed him to our, our team, um, and he hasn't left yet. So <laughs> let's hope that he, uh, that he sticks around. Our brain trust to this is our, our board of directors, our board of advisors, um, listed here in, in, in importance and alphabetical order. Uh, but Anna, Kendra here, Jim, Jerry, Carmen, Anne, Doug, Wayne, uh, Simon Hall, and Gene Minkle. So thank you for, for all of your support. A lot of, uh, again, a lot of this is, is dependent on having some really good speakers. I was extremely impressed, the board was in, impressed too, with the, with the level of submissions that came in. That's partially the reason why we decided to increase the number of sessions this year to see uh, how that worked out. It's the same if you notice, we had a lot more pre-conference workshops this year than we've had in, in, in the past, because we decided to just open up. There's, there's one thing I think that makes the ISS successful, both here in Vancouver and around the world, is we, we maintain a level of transparency. Um, it's, it's not a club. If you've got something you want to share, you've got research, clinical ideas, strategies, um, we encourage you to submit to the conferences. And if you need assistance with that, if you're new, you're not sure, any of us um, on the Board of Advisors, other seating symposiums are always willing to have discussions and provide mentorship. So I do want to acknowledge the speakers that are really the foundation of, of this conference. Also a, good part, a big part of the International Seating Symposium is having a nice balance of good learning opportunities, but also open exposure to what the greatest and, and new technologies that exist in our field, which thank God continues to grow. I was extremely impressed yesterday walking through the exhibit hall. And again, we're, we're in a situation where perhaps things aren't going as well as we like them to in the industry, but the industry is still, still growing and the field is still growing. So with that also, the, the, the number of moderators and monitors that are required to be here. Yesterday we also had Consumer Day, which is something that we've been um, testing to see if it makes sense to include in, uh, consumers as part of the exhibition. But I think what's most important is having consumers being as much a part of this conference as clinicians, developers, policy makers. I really feel that ISS is that platform where everybody can come together and um, bring, their, bring their ideas and strategies. So with that also are a, a quite a few number of volunteers to, to run the event. Um, when I talk about logistics in a few minutes, we can um, explain how that's working, but I do have to acknowledge uh, the students, the occupational therapy students from Belmont University that have working behind the scenes and also the students from the university, the graduate students that we have from the University of Pittsburgh that are here. I, again, encourage the students to take this opportunity to network, get to meet people, and as, as attendees, potential employers, I encourage you to interact with the students also. I mean, the reality is they are everything about uh, our future. Over the last year, we've had some, some great uh, progress and opportunities. Last May, we uh, co-hosted the first Asia-Pacific Region Seating Symposium in Xi'an, China. Uh, with probably about 300 to 400 attendees. Several manufacturers from North America and Europe uh, met with us there, and we hope that Zhu Wang, who is, uh, was the, the co-chair of the event, one of, the, one of our former, or, um, an alum of our department, uh, that will continue to grow. I've had, we've had many discussions with other partners in the Asia Pacific um, region who would be interested to continue to, to allow this or to make this, this symposium grow. So that, that was very nice to see that, you know, years ago we expanded with the first European seating symposium, then the Latin American seating symposium. We've, we've done one in India, now we've done one in Asia. So the, the family is growing. Again, in June, 
uh, Latin American Seating Symposium is going to occur again in Cordoba. Silvana is here if, you, if you're interested in participating in that event. The website is up and the program is being developed. Uh, they're moving it from Buenos Aires to Cordoba to be more inland and also accessible to more people who live on the inland of um, the South American continent, the Argentina area. Uh, Dublin, the fifth European Seating Symposium. We, we had the fourth in uh, November of, of 2013. Simon Hall will be hosting uh, the, the European Seating Symposium again uh, in, uh, in June now of, um, of, of, 20, of 2016. So, and of course, we can't forget about the 32nd International Seating Symposium that's gonna happen again in Vancouver uh, next year. So I'd like to take, or have Jerry Dickerson come up here and take a few moments to recognize a couple of people, um, as well as Derek. Um, with, with our industry growing and maturing, unfortunately we've lost a few people or a couple of people in the last year, and I'd like them to take a few moments to recognize them. Thanks, Mark. Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Jerry Dickerson. I don't know how to begin to <clears throat> introduce this. Um, in a moment, I'll uh, introduce Derek Fletcher to say a few words about Steve Scribner, but I looked on the internet to come up with something that we could uh, introduce this little segment for, and, and what I found was, um, as time marches on, we can regret things not done, words not said, and friends and colleagues not remembered. We have arrived at a point in our lives when we have to acknowledge transition and remember those who are no longer among us. So I would like to introduce Derek Fletcher to say a few words about our friend, Steve Scribner. Thank you, Jerry. Wrote it down so I can uh, hopefully get through this. Thank you for allowing me to speak this morning about my good friend, Steve Scribner. Steve passed away on uh, April 24th, 2014. He lived courageously with brain cancer for a year and a half, and he was able to witness the birth of and to hold in his arms his uh, grandson, Jake, so his life was complete. Steve was a much loved member of the uh, Snug Seat family, and he is sorely missed by everyone there. He was my brother in arms. He was truly one of the most unique people I have ever met, and I mean unique in every sense of the word. He was a rapscallion at heart and was consumed with living life. He loved being a dad to his two daughters, Micah and Sarah. He was a proud and decorated veteran serving in Vietnam. He was a lover of his country and of this industry and was the most politically opinionated and politically incorrect person I have ever met. He was opinionated, outspoken, and ornery. While we disagreed on many things, we had great debates and nonstop discussions. He always made me think, and I thank him for that. As a man of faith, I learned a deeper compassion and empathy from my friend as he struggled with daily life. I watched that struggle up close, and I asked God many times, why? But it came to this. I loved him, and he loved me, and that was enough. I don't back away from, and I'm not ashamed of that statement, because it is the very purpose of life. It was why we were created in the first place, to love and to be loved. God created this world and everything in it for that purpose alone, love. For those of you who knew Steve, it's hard to capture the essence of a person in just a few moments but here it goes anyway. Steve was smart and witty, challenging and profane, a born storyteller with a gift of gab. He never met a stranger and was fearless in his approach to life. He possessed a politician's skill of working a crowd while stomping all over the boundaries of decency and decorum. You sometimes hated him. More often, you loved him, but you never forgot him. As Stuart Scott famously said, you beat cancer by how you live. Well, I'm here to tell you, Steve lived life to the full. He loved this industry and the people in it. He cared deeply about the families and, in our case, children that we were privileged, privileged to serve. I thank God that he allowed me the privilege of knowing him. I'm thankful that most of you in here knew him too. He was our friend. He was my friend, and I miss him. I love you, sunshine. 
I want to thank you for granting me this honor of sharing with you my friend Steve. Technology. Oh, 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 oh. There you go. One more. One, take it easy. I told you start to be eight. Next week, it will be 14 months since those of us that work in the greater New York City area in wheel in, uh, seating and wheel mobility began to get the early morning texts, phone calls, and emails of a profoundly sad event that if true, we all knew things would never be the same. On January 3rd, our friend and colleague, Kenneth Gant, passed away unexpectedly at the age of 52. Forgive me, I have to read this. Um, Kenneth was a compassionate and caring therapist, a skilled seating clinician, and he cared deeply for the people that he worked with. He was a kind and gentle man that advocated for each of his consumers. It was his gentle nature that allowed our friendship to remain intact through the frustrations of clinic, when he would push for something for a consumer against my ever-present, who's paying for this? <laughs> Kenneth was a son, a grandson, a brother, both an uncle and a nephew, a fabulous dancer, and a friend to everyone he met. And he was a once-in-a-lifetime companion to his very best friend, Wendy. <clears throat> These were both just short, recognitions of Steve and Kenneth. They were not meant to be eulogies and certainly not reflections on their lives, but a reminder of all of, to all of us that life is very short. I know that I speak for everyone that knew them both when I, when I think that we think about them every day. And now in their memory, I ask each of you for just a moment if you would close your eyes and think of them too. Thank you. And I made it without crying. Thank you, Jerry and Derek. So I'd like to move on with uh, just a few housekeeping and logistics issues. Um, this is our third time at the Opryland, uh, Gaylord Opryland Hotel. Uh, yes, I still get lost also. Nothing to do with my eyesight, but it is a confusing place. Uh, we do have volunteers stationed throughout the facility with the yellow lanyards to help with, with navigation and orientation. But with that, we also have a lot of great opportunities here at this hotel. I'll repeat them as I've done in many years for as the, the rationale for being here in Nashville. It is because it is a great location. We're close to several surrounding states, a fairly large population. Uh, other than this week, it's an easy place to drive to, okay? <laughs> an easy place to fly to. We could have had this last week when the Nashville airport was shut down because from my understanding, they don't own any de-icing equipment. So, uh, but we are here putting on a conference of this magnitude and size it does require us to have a fairly large exhibition space, lots of meeting spaces. Um, the only other facilities of this nature that we could perhaps find would be in, in Las Vegas, but I'm not going to Las Vegas, so. <laughs> so, um, so it is what it is, it's, it's large. Uh, the exhibition hall uh, is right below us. We've been fortunate too that we were able to move down here to the presidential uh, ballrooms. If you look at the size of this room, like I said, there's about 2,000 of you in this room and we could probably fit another 500 to 1,000. So I'm hoping that by 2017, we've outgrown this space as well. Um, so this is, this is the situation that we're in. I do also want to encourage you to visit the exhi exhibition hall as much as you can. We've pl left plenty of room open for some unopposed times. For instance, this afternoon at, at 11 when we're done here, let's all go downstairs. We serve all meals down there. Uh, so we have a walkabout lunch. We've set up some tables for people to sit if they would like to do that. This evening we're going to have a, a reception in there and then all other breakfast, lunches and breaks are gonna take place in the exhibit hall. Also, as we've done in past years, there is no exhibition on Saturday. 
Um, th but I do know there's always a few people I run into in the hallways on Saturday saying, did you move the exhibit hall? Uh, we, it, it, it is going to end on Friday, but we are going to keep it open um, until the end of uh, the last until the end of the last break um, on Friday. Just a few other things. Uh, preparedness is always important. Emergency exits, medical emergencies. If you dial a house phone, it's 5555. We do have a paramedic on site um, if 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 that uh, service is needed. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to talk about the ISS One celebration, or as some of us are calling the party of the year. This year we, we decided that rather than having multiple competing events occurring sort of at the same time and in similar places, is could we pull everybody together to do one celebration. This also creates a better situation for some of us that deal with conflicts of interest from our workplace. Uh, the party celebration is, is, is inclusive of everyone. Now, the issue we ran into with this is that uh, we figured about a thousand people might want to come to this. We rented the Wild Horse Saloon in downtown Nashville to hold a thousand people, raised money so that the cost of the party was reasonable to attendees, and we sold out. Now, instead of saying those of you that don't have a ticket can't come, we've made arrangements for 200 more tickets that are available for sale. However, they're not available at the discounted price or cost, I should say, that we uh, were originally able to uh, negotiate. So I do encourage people to attend tonight. I think it's gonna be a very good time. If those, in the past we've had activities taking place in and around the hotel here, but this is a great opportunity to get down in, into the city of Nashville and visit, and visit uh, downtown. There's gonna be buses leaving tonight at 7.30, and they will be circling all night until 11 o'clock, the last bus, when the last bus leaves. I encourage you not to stay out too late because we have things to do tomorrow morning. But, uh, but like I said, this, this is an opportunity to bring everybody together for, for, one, for one celebration. And like I said, if you would like to purchase tickets, they're $88. Um, Don, who's gonna come up here in a moment, will be selling them at the end cart booth and also over by the registration table. And the purpose of the celebration is when we talked about this, and I was gonna talk about it at the beginning, it is the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't recognize that as part of the 2015 uh, ISS. And I think we've come a long way in 25 years, as many of you know who are from the United States, and in the, even those of you that are from other countries, the ADA has served as a very nice model of inclusion and accessibility. Uh, what it what unfortunately has not done is it has not increased employment opportunities and other social living opportunities for people with disabilities, so I think it's time that this be revisited. Um, our closing keynote speaker on Saturday will be James Weissman, for, for those of you who know Jim, a uh, very well-recognized advocate, attorney, who played a key role in the development of uh, and the passing of the ADA. The other thing that came to, to uh, my attention is it's also been 25 years since the Berlin Wall came down. It came down in November of, uh, of 1989. Um, and if you look at the attendance at the conference and it's growing, it's showing that we continue to unfortunately encounter many instances of war and terrorism around the country. Our role as rehabilitation professionals is to help support people who are affected by those things and to share our knowledge and resources internationally to support people with disabilities, uh, regardless of how or why those occur. Um, other logistics, continuing education units, you those of you that need CEUs, the process is what it has been in the past. For those of you that are new to the ISS, a code is issued at the end of every session. Keep track of that code. Log back into the uh, RSTCE portal, and the process is, is I hope, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, what we're also doing new this year is, uh, for those of you who have registered for continuing education, you will have open access to, continue, to CEU credits for any of our online webinars, on-demand webinars. Uh, we will send instructions on how to do that, but basically it'll be, you'll be given a code, 
when you watch a webinar, if you take the post test, instead of having to pay uh, with a credit card, you can just enter the coupon code and you'll have them at, at, at no cost. Uh, and again, I think that's one of our ways to share and make available the openness of, of the education we have. This year we, we did um, go with an app. I guess that's part of bringing younger people onto your team. They said you need to get with the times and get an app. So we have an app. I even know how to use it, which is phenomenal. I have trouble seeing it, but it's usable. If you, if you want to download the app, you can go to Whatever, the, whatever app store you have as part of your provider, whether it's iTunes or some Android device. Um, I've also learned what a QR code is. It's this little black thing with, with, with boxes. Supposedly when you scan that, it's like a barcode. It takes you right to the, to the website. And Kendra said it worked for her too. So um, what's nice about the app is it, it, it will hopefully help reduce the amount of paper we print in the future. But everything that you want to know about the conference is on the app. The speakers, the exhibitors, the schedule. Um, there are maps there. But what it doesn't do is tell you how to get around the Gaylord Hotel. <laughs> I, I requested that from the app developers, but they said GPS doesn't work well indoors. Um, I tried to explain that RFID might be an opportunity in the future, which um, most likely will. But just know that that, that is an option. Another thing we're trying this year is uh, simultaneous Spanish translation. So those of you uh, where Spanish is, is a language that's easier for you to understand, um, headsets are available, and you can listen to this to any sessions that will be taking place in the plenary room or in this ballroom during the regular conference. So, and I think it's important too in the future that we look at other languages as our as our uh, attendance grows internationally. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Don Clayback. Don is the uh, executive director of the National Coalition of Assistive and Rehab Technology, who has really taken the lead on advocacy work here in the United States that I also think will be of mutual benefit to our, our uh, colleagues internationally. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for the opportunity to just take a couple of minutes and give the group an update on some things that are going on in the legislative environment. Um, when we spoke two years ago here to give an update, we talked about our uh, federal legislation, uh, which is the uh, Ensuring Access to Quality Complex Rehabilitation Technology Act. And we've been making good progress on that. Uh, it's been governed by a steering committee that consists of providers, manufacturers, consumer organizations, and clinician organizations. And I think it's really brought uh, the, the CRT community, and right now we're defining CRT as including specialized wheelchairs, seating uh, systems, and other adaptive equipment such as standards and gait trainers and bathing equipment, but that is, can be expanded as we move forward. Um, but out of this effort, we've got legislation that was introduced in Congress, both in the Senate and the House. And in last year, we finished with 190 members of Congress signed on, uh, 168 on the House side, 22 on the Senate side. So it's, it's great progress, and it really was a credit to a lot of people and a lot of organizations reaching out to their members of Congress. And when we talk about assistive technology and the access to that, uh, I think it's safe to say, at least from our perspective, that that access is under attack, whether you look at the federal programs, Medicare, or the state programs, Medicaid, or when you're looking at private insurance companies. So the fact that we can come together and talk about this today I think is a great thing, and it's really a necessary thing that we all, uh, as a community, come together and tell our policymakers they need to make sure access is, remains a priority. We're going to be getting the bill introduced uh, probably in the next two weeks. This is a new session of Congress. so. Last year's bills die and the new bills need to get introduced. So we'll be uh, talking about this. Uh, there'll be announcements once the bill gets dropped. Uh, we also have a conference, uh, the National CRT Conference that's held in Washington. Uh, that's a joint uh, partnership between NCART and NARTS. Uh, we get 200 to 220 people coming in and there's some uh, advocacy work along with some education, both on a federal and state level. So uh, we're happy to share more details about that. Uh, on the state side, we're also moving uh, to address some, state, some issues on the Medicaid front, and we're looking at introducing either legislation in some states 
or working with the Medicaid programs to introduce policies that are really focused on CRT. Uh, it's really an offshoot of our federal work because the idea between the federal, uh, with the federal legislation is to get it passed at the Medicare level and then that will flow through to other payers. But we're also kind of coming at it from the ground up and doing things on a state level. And we've had success in the states of Colorado, Connecticut, and Washington, where legislation's already been passed. And we're currently working on the states Florida, Ohio, Oklahoma, Michigan, New York, and Wisconsin. Uh, and then finally, I'd encourage everybody to stay informed. We, uh, you can uh, sign up at the NCART website for updates. Uh, where you'll just get alerts as they come out that may be of interest or at least will keep you informed if they don't directly impact your area. Uh, there's a variety of information on our website. Uh, and we also are giving a CRT update today at 2.30. So for those who would like more information on some of the things that are going on, we'd encourage you to attend that or stop by our booth, which is booth number 97. And lastly, Mark had mentioned the party tonight. We do have tickets available. Um, and we've got a limited number, so if you're interested, there will be a table uh, nearby the registration desk, and they'll also be available at the NCART booth, which is NCART uh, booth number 97. Thank you. Thank you, Don, and, and thank you for taking the lead on advocacy in, in the field of, of complex rehab technology. We all know that it's a uh, a full-time job, if anything, is something that you just have to keep at continuously for for a long time. But Don Don's had the the patience, I guess, and the tenacity to keep plugging away at this. So thank you. Um, I did want to also just highlight some of the events that are going to be happening. I, I I wish I could take the time to acknowledge every single presenter and every single session because they're all very good. Again, we're doing some new stuff this year. Um, trying to avoid all the death by PowerPoint and, and be different. So tomorrow morning we have a lovely Miss Kendra Betts doing the ISS morning show, hot topics in wheeled mobility and seating. Um, Kendra is hoping that she'll be discovered tomorrow and she can give up her high-paid government job and move on to a life of fame and fortune doing uh, wheelchair talk shows. That's right. right. So. Uh, Part of that also, so she has she has three esteemed guests. One is actually sitting up here. Dr. Michael Boninger uh, will be talking, as well as our, our close friend and colleague, Dr. Steve Spriggle from Georgia Tech. Uh, we know that he's also got a few things to say. And uh, Sharon Sutherland, uh, just to round it out and make it all nice and balanced. So I think that'll be, that'll be a lot of fun. Um, we'll be using audience response systems. Um, in all of our forums, or at least the two forums tomorrow, so that'll also make it pretty interactive. And you know what I like about the audience response system is they're anonymous, so people really tell you how they feel. So uh, we'll take advantage of that tomorrow afternoon. Gene Minkle has uh, once again agreed to run the uh, ISS forum on the topic of whose job is it anyway. I've looked at some of the questions she's put together for the audience response system, so I, I would highly recommend that you, you, you make sure you're, you're at this session um, also. Our closer, I talked earlier, um, is going to be James Weissman. As I said, uh, uh, Jim is, is a well-known attorney and advocate in the, in the field of disability. Uh, he's the vice president and, and general counsel for United Spinal Association, who will be giving a talk on the Americans with Disabilities Act why it was and still is is necessary. And I think those of you who have heard heard uh, Jim speak, he's very informative, but, but also has some very funny stories to talk about advocacy and history of disability uh, over time. For our keynotes uh, this morning, um, actually Rory will be, will be speaking first, but I'll just go back here. Mike, Michael Boninger will be talking about brain-computer interfaces. Um, which I've asked him to come and do this because it is a topic and an area that seems to be catching a lot of media attention, seems to be a lot about what our future might be. But I know that Mike has um, a pretty good handle and has been, been able to work closely with a lot of the agencies and research labs around the country and world that are putting together some of these technologies and he'll be able to share with us sort of where, where that area um, is headed. Um, I do have to mention, too, that both Mike and, and Rory, who are up here, 
uh, both of them came to the University of Pittsburgh about a year before I did. And uh, we are celebrating our 20th anniversary now as a, as a department. So that, that's partially the reason why I've asked them to come up here and talk. Uh, but it has been an honor and, a, and, and a, I'm going to say an honor and a challenge. It's been an honor <laughs> and a lot of fun to work with both of them um, in watching our department grow both in magnitude, size, research, and, and also being able to see a lot of our students who are or former students that are actually in the audience and, and leaders um, in this industry. And partially also why I brought my good friend Simon Margolis up here, who was also a, a, a mentor to myself as I was, I was coming up uh, in the early days. Simon would often pull me aside and give me a beating and, and tell me to, to calm down and uh, be a little more diplomatic. Um, and so with that, um, I'll turn it over to uh, Kendra in just a second here to introduce Dr. Cooper. But uh, the theme of this year's International Seating Symposium is the next chapter. And Rory will be giving a talk about that. What is the next chapter in seating, in seating and mobility? So I'm going to let Kendra go up here if you want to switch that over. Yep. Thank you. Um, just want to congratulate Mark Schmaler and the ISS team for getting us off to what is sure to be a fantastic event for the next couple of days. So congratulations, Mark. It is my honor to um, introduce our first keynote speaker. Dr. Rory Cooper is a FISA and Paralyzed Veterans of America Chair and Distinguished Professor of Rehabilitation Science and Technology at the University of Pittsburgh. He is founding director and VA senior research career scientist of the Human Engineering Research Laboratories in Pittsburgh. Dr. Cooper has helped author 300 peer-reviewed journal publications and 15 patents. Dr. Cooper is a former president of Resna. He currently serves as an honorary board of advisors for the Student Veterans of America, the National Science Foundation Advisory Committee for Education and Human Resources, the Board of Directors for Easter Seals, Command Council, Staff Sergeant Donnie D. Dixon, Center for Military and Veterans Community Services, and Board of PVA Research Foundation. Welcome, Dr. Cooper. Thank, thank you, Kendra, for that generous introduction, and, and welcome, everyone. It's, it's really great. I've, I've been to probably 20 of the 31, if not more, of the seating symposium. It's, it's just amazing the transformation that, that, that it's taken. And I'd like to thank Mark and, and his staff for putting this together and, and, and doing such a great job to bringing us here. Oh, I need that click right there. Uh, thank you. So, um, but I'd like to take us in a little bit different direction. It'll be, uh, I think Mark, you know, Mike is going to be very focused. I think Simon is going to tell us a little bit about uh, lessons that we should have learned. And um, it makes me feel like home. When I was sitting next to Simon, he was president of Resident when I was president-elect. And so we, we would sit together a lot like this, and Simon was very good about sharing uh, sage advice. So he might whisper a few things in my ear while I'm up here. So let me show you a, a grand challenge. There, at least conservatively estimated, there are 70 million people in the world who need a wheelchair for mobility. That number actually could be closer to 100 million. And only about 20 million of them have access to a wheelchair. So, you know, I'm essentially one of the fortunate ones. I have access to a wheelchair. And, uh, but most people don't. And so it's just, I want to put this in perspective. There is a tremendous need for us. Oops. And, but the awareness is growing, and just in some ways, I'm, I'm old enough to have participated in the uh, sports movement uh, in order to get full inclusion uh, of people with disabilities. I don't think we've reached full inclusion. I think the ADA was a step in the right direction. I think 
new, uh, several other legislations, the United States IDEA is a step in the right direction. The UN Convention on Human Rights for People with Disabilities is certainly a step in the right direction. I also think that we have to look at us in a, as a broader community. And I wanted to throw in the Paralympics, not only because um, I was once an athlete, but because athletes have done a lot as well. And you can see, interesting here, these statistics I got from the International Paralympic Committee, as that the number of countries participating in the Paralympics are growing. And as you know, there's you know, somewhere between 170 and 190 countries in the world, depending on any given day and how you want to count them. Uh, so we're getting close to that number, which is amazing, because uh, you can think of it, in 1960, there were less than 20 countries that they would even participate. As a matter of fact, up until about 2000, when the Paralympics became part of the International Olympic Committee, a lot of countries didn't even admit having people with disabilities. And now, uh, they participate in the Paralympic Games, and not only do they participate, they, but they feel honored, and they count their medals towards the medal count. And as you see, the number of athletes growing, or is growing and participating in the, in the Paralympic Games as well. That number is a little bit artificial because it's capped at 4,000 athletes. And it's really capped at 4,000 athletes because of the logistics of running such a large event like the Paralympics, just as the Olympics are capped at about 8,000 athletes. That's not necessarily a bad thing uh, because it means that uh, everybody has to increase the standard of living and the quality of services available for people with disabilities if they want to get them into the Paralympics. So in some ways it's a motivator. If it's important for your national pride to participate in the Olympic, in Paralympics and have athletes in the Paralympics, then you need to provide better services for those people. <clears throat> so we all, I think this is somewhat preaching to the choir, but if you think about what is the common denominator worldwide, why should we provide good quality wheelchairs? Well, one is that lack of mobility impairs limit uh, or uh, impairs social participation. And I'm from Pittsburgh, and I actually was in D.C. before coming here. By having mobility, that allowed me to participate in work, travel to D.C., lobby or educate our government, or try to, and then come to, uh, to ISS and speak with you and learn with you. Of course, it has a, a significant impact on quality of life for the person, but it actually has quality of life impact on not only the person, but the family, the village, the community, and society as a whole. Right? I'm better for society if I can be mobile, go to school, go to work, and contribute, or volunteer. Then I'm providing resources to the community. And then, of course, that has social and financial impact as well. We all know that you need to have appropriate wheelchairs meet the user's needs and the user's environment. I don't want to criticize, but I, don't, I actually don't think this is about complex rehab uh, or not complex rehab. I'll be, uh, frankly, I think if rehab involves a wheelchair, it's complex rehab. I've never seen, wheel, I've never seen quote, simple rehab that involves somebody needing a wheelchair. And so I know that's kind of a, way, a message for our political, uh, political world, but it's really about getting the appropriate wheelchair for the individual to meet their needs in the environment that they're in and for maximizing participation. I hope when, we, when, when NCARD and NARTS and others speak to the government, one, one positive example is that I think the VA, it still, by and large, gets it right. I mean, there's room for improvement for everybody, but I'm a, I'm a veteran, and you know, this wheelchair is provided by the VA, and the VA has a larger, larger mission besides providing mobility in the home, but also providing mobility in the community and promoting social integration and participation. And that's really what we want to uh, move towards for everybody. And of course, the other part is you have to have both the strong technical and clinical services available. And we, you know, Resna worked on that through the APT, but that's just really a, a US-centric uh, uh, when we need to work on that as well. And I think one of the great things is the um, UN standard rule in that trying to grow uh, the human rights of people with disabilities and 
the strong emphasis on assistive technology. So let me uh, throw this out. Um, I'm not married to these definitions, but I want you to think about it. So we don't want to provide wheelchairs that might injure, do not fit, or do not provide appropriate mobility or function. That's, that's the, what I'd say, an inappropriate wheelchair. On the other side, we do want to provide wheelchairs that are safe, comfortable, promote social integration, provide mobility and function. They're also durable, repairable, and aesthetically pleasing. I, I, I'm a strong proponent that a wheelchair is actually an extension of self and that you want to present that, that image. Whether that's an image of being athletic, being a, a professional, uh, but it's all part of that, that same system. So here's part of the problem. The demand exceeds the supply. There are um, 20 million, there's, so I said there's a need for 70 million wheelchairs, maybe 100 million. About 20 million people have access to one. About 8 million of those wheelchairs are used in the United States or Europe. About 12 million individuals in the world actually have their own wheelchair. That means of the 20 million wheelchairs that are out there, about 8 million people are sharing a wheelchair. They don't actually have their own, but they, there's one in the institution, there might be one at the school that they can use. There's about 6 million wheelchairs produced a year, and over half of those are produced in China. And they last on average three years. So, I'm an engineer, you do the math, you get six million a year, they last three years, that's about 18 million wheelchairs, so a few of them last three and a half years or four years, that gets you to 20 million. So that tells you we've got a, a couple of problems. Uh, we don't have enough production capacity, we don't have enough, uh, and the wheelchairs don't last long enough, and um, they're not evenly distributed, right? They're, they're not, but basically they're going to the, uh, to the more resourced countries in the world. I thought, now you should know everybody in those pictures, I hope. That's, on the, on the left is Marilyn Hamilton, uh, and she's the, uh, one of the founders of the of Quickie Wheelchair. I always loved that. The woman that invented the Quickie, how can you not love that? <laughs> and then uh, Ralph, Ralph Hotchkiss uh, with the Whirlwind Wheelchairs, and uh, David Constantine with motivation, and if you can recognize, that's me actually doing some welding in India. Um, and I think that's also important. You know, think of, can't just think of wheelchair users as consumers, but they also can be inventors, and they can be clinicians, uh, they can be uh, professionals. They, they need to be part of our, um, we need to view them as being part of the community as well. So we do need to improve quality. The ISO first published uh, wheelchair standards in 1990. And, uh, and I think they've helped improve quality. Um, unfortunately, despite having ISO standards and despite having in the United States ANSI ResNA standards and FDA requiring them in, in various bodies around the world, there are still a lot of wheelchairs that actually are not compliant with ISO standards. And I think that there's two problems. One, uh, we need better engineering. Uh, part of that also, and I will I admit, has to do with reimbursement in the delivery system. If you don't have adequate reimbursement, it's very dark to, um, to build a good product when you're basically when your largest customers are telling you how much they're willing to pay. So they tell you, you know, I, I, want, a, I want a diamond, but I'm only gonna, I'm only gonna pay for quartz and you, you kind of run into this problem back and forth, and we need to put pressure on that as well. But also, consumers and clinicians need to know about what's a good quality wheelchair. They need to ask about whether this wheelchair has gone through testing. And that's not true just for the US, it's true worldwide, right? If you're, even if you're getting a free wheelchair in Zimbabwe, uh, it's probably worthwhile to know whether that wheelchair is going to last for you or uh, if it's going to fail prematurely. And is it appropriate for your environment? And I do think we need to do a better job. I highlighted some failures in these slides, and, and frankly, a lot of the failures that we have seen um, in our testing and in the field are failures that really a, a person who's finished their junior year in college um, should know not to, to make, those mistakes. 
Um, on the back side, uh, this is, I stole this work from John Perlman, one of my colleagues, but uh, the, uh, is you need quality control and you need good repair as well. And I think one of the problems that we have is um, there are a lot of our consumers that they don't, they, we don't see them that often. And they don't even think about it. Most of you, I hope, um, change your oil before you see the check engine light. Right? Most of you change the washer fluid in your car or refill the washer fluid in your car uh, every once in a while. Um, you might even, you know, check your tire pressure or even, you know, to, if you go to, uh, you know, Quickie Lube or Jiffy Lube that they'll, at least you know, hey, you'll take it there on a periodic basis. They'll change the oil. They'll put air in your tires. They'll tell you, we, we don't do that for wheelchair users, right? You give them a wheelchair and... Sometimes you don't see them for three or five years later, or um, you know they don't even check their tire pressure, check their spokes. They wonder why their chair is drifting to the left or to the right, and you know they've been riding on a with one you know 100 psi on one side and 40 psi on the other side, and it would have just taken a bicycle pump. So we need to get people thinking about that as well. I actually Mark mentioned apps, and that's another example, right? You could you give everybody when they get their new wheelchair, you scan the QR code, give them an app, the app on their phone, their phone tells them, hey, check your tire pressure. Hey, give me a call. I mean, maybe it's a good time to get your wheelchair serviced. So we can think about those things. Uh, research is essential. Um, I heard uh, Steve Spriegel's name. I see Dave Brienza sitting back there. I mean, did you know that there is no longer a NIDER RERC on wheelchairs and seating? Hopefully, there's a, there's a call for proposals on mobility and manipulation, but we, we, we don't, there is no specific center about wheelchairs and mobility uh, when there's 100 million people or 70 to 100 million people that need them. I mean, that's, that's a shame, right? We should have our own, actually, we should have two RERCs, personally. I think one on wheelchairs and one on seating. Uh, there's enough of a demand and they're complex enough. Uh, and what do we need to know? We do know how wheelchairs are used. Uh, what people do with them, uh, what are some of the weaknesses of the current designs, recommend improvements. Uh, the wheelchair is not perfect, uh, it never has been. Hopefully it eventually will be or we won't need them anymore. <clears throat> and then, you know, there's the, there are secondary consequences to wheelchair usage. Some are very obvious, like pressure ulcers. Um, you know, Mike has done some tremendous, uh, uh, tremendously important work on repetitive strain injuries, carpal tunnel syndrome, rotator cuff injuries that, that we all experience, uh, or at least try not to experience. And we need to expand mobility, and we see some products in the exhibit hall to do that. And last, we need to understand and promote uh, full participation. And we're, it's great now that we're in a world where we can share this information globally and rapidly. I mean, we need our friends with the World Wide Web and Internet access to help us get you know, greater penetration around the world. Uh, but you know, as they do, our, our knowledge gets shared and our knowledge ripples expand as well. One of the, this is just a study that uh, uh, actually that John and I did in, in India a few years ago, and it um, used actually the power of the Internet, uh, provided um, basically asked people to take pictures of their, of their barriers or their environment. So everybody going home from rehab, you can actually all do this study now, right? Almost everybody has a phone with them that has a camera in there, set up a website, ask them to upload their pictures of the barriers that they see, and then um, you can use both consumers and clinicians to rate those barriers. And you can see there's a, you get a lot of interest in surface stability, uh, doorway widths, you know, toilet heights, and what's, what we had people do is rate the frequency they see these barriers and the severity of these barriers. But this data gives us some idea of how to focus on problems. Oops. Service delivery is essential. Um, I think many of you know my wife, Rosie. She's uh, assisting her, her mother, who's ill in Germany. But, uh, so this is my chance to have her be at ISS briefly. And Zhang Bei is uh, here from Korea, one of our former students. Um, Service delivery, I, I'm a firm believer in the team approach of service delivery. And having rehab engineers, OTs, PTs, physicians, uh, rehab counselors, actually audiologists, speech pathologists, all, all together. Um, you know, Mike could speak to this better than I can, but 
You just never know, right? Somebody comes in for a new wheelchair and you find out that they can't hear well, they're on comm device, uh, they haven't been using regularly, and they, um, their wheelchair doesn't fit in their vehicle. We have an adaptive driving program. And so, you know, if you could kind of make it a one-stop shop, people might come in for one reason, but you can address a host of other reasons. And of course, you can avoid the problem of having, um, you know, one, one person fit one piece of technology, another piece of another technology, and it's not integrated, not seamless in a part of a person's life. And we have to really work at getting the most appropriate wheelchair for, the most, for, that, for that person's environment and their career and life goals. And develop wheelchair skills. And then um, and that, clinical, that clinical work should be based on a science, found scientific and clinical knowledge. And we're fortunate that organizations like PVA have put together some clinical practice guidelines, and ResNA's got its white papers that are all helpful, but all of those will show that the scientific, scientific evidence is still relatively weak for most of the things that we do. So Lee, I told you I'd have you in my slides. <laughs> um, I mean, I think wheelchair skills training is, is essential to a quality of life. You can get a good wheelchair, you get the properly fitting wheelchair. I see this very often. Uh, Kendra and I actually talk about this quite frequently. Uh, you, uh, you see a, a person, a young person, 25 years old, they've got a, a great wheelchair, but they can't do a wheelie, they can't hop a curb. Um, they still actually, they have uh, anti-tippers on the back, and they, uh, and they don't, and they, you know, they have their, um, a friend or a spouse loading in a car. That's just a shame. And I think when we talk about getting better wheelchairs, um, we also need to fight for um, better wheelchair skills. And I think part of the problem is the length of stay, um, which is a problem. Um, I mean, I think there's kind of a twofold problem here. One is access to qualified clinicians who know about wheelchairs and can provide the skills. And the other problem is the issue of um, length of stay and rehab in order to get people the, the time they need to develop those skills. But we know that you can teach skills, and that greatly impacts mobility. Uh, you need to collect data. So a little pitch for Mark and the functional mobility assessment. And I think what you can see, if you collect data as suppliers and as clinicians, you'll change your practices. You'll see if that product makes a difference, then why don't you provide more of that product? If that product is not being used, you'll see differences. So we need to to work on worldwide outcome data sets. We should have uh, know what products work for people, how wheelchair skills training works for people, what clinical models works for people, and have evidence to support that. I also think we need to promote the power of invention. Um, I don't know if fortunately or unfortunately, I was around to see um, Quadra and Quickie and um, Top End and uh, lots of other, uh, Tylite, all those companies come about as a uh, power of invention. And, and I also see that a lot of that was driven by exciting consumers. And some of you have been in the field for a long time, but I, I, some of you maybe haven't. So in the 1980s, you bought those products. Consumers actually paid for them out of pocket. They uh, even, even the VA wouldn't provide the quickie wheelchairs the first couple of years they came out. I actually purchased my own, and then, um, and then I turned it in to my insurance company for a reimbursement. That was, the, that was how good the products were uh, compared to what was on the market at the time. And I think we need to look at still doing, you know, using that as to help meet this need, think out of the box, try to drive for a more competitive economy, Let's create jobs and improve people's lives. Along those lines, I wanted to just let you know, think, thinking outside the box, that the Lemelson Foundation has started this international ambassadors program of inventors. And you can, they're actually soliciting candidates now. Uh, Lemelson Foundation's a, a, a billion dollar foundation here in the United States. They're supporting the power of invention around the world. And that's not something that we would necessarily think of applying in wheelchairs and seating. And you know, there's people like um, the founder of Whole Foods, or one of the founders there, Paul 
Pulse Demitz is on there, um, the inventor of the digital camera. So there's just some pretty amazing things um, to get involved. I think communication and dissemination is essential as well. That's why I'm happy that you're all here and that you hopefully you'll all stay connected. There's some great outlets. Uh, ISS, of course, uh, we put the Europe, you know, these are not, this is not intended to be an all-inclusive list. European Seating Symposium, RESNA, AAA, TE, RESGE. Also, if you look on the left side of that slide, those are some of the great materials available for free from the World Health Organization with support from uh, USAID. And while it's still basic material, there's a lot of people in the world that can benefit from that. I think we need to move further towards professionalization. I think Resna made the bright move, a daring move actually in the 1990s with the ATP uh, in order to help increase professionalization. But that's really kind of US centric and that's, um, or even North America centric. I threw in ISPO, that's the International Society for Prosthetics and Orthotics, because I think they've done a better job of doing this worldwide. So I want to make a shameless plug for the International Society of Wheelchair Professionals. We had a sort of an advisory board meeting last night, uh, the first one, and um, the idea is to let's try to bring everybody together in the world in this field, uh, share our knowledge, communicate, and work to improve the quality of wheelchairs and service delivery of wheelchairs around the world so that we can elevate the quality of life of all wheelchair users. And it's about empowering people with disabilities. And there's some great documents. The International Classification of Function, ICF, the UN Convention on Human Rights for People with Disabilities, the World Report on Disabilities. All of these are things that you really should learn about so you can put your work in context. So if you look at the UN World Report on Disabilities, you know, it it's got a, talks about a lot of the same things that we talk about here it's got some great data behind it, and it's got a worldwide perspective. Policy, that's what we're talking about, complex rehab. Strengthening the health system, which is about service delivery. Um, how about changing attitudes towards people with disabilities, access towards technology and services, addressing the gaps in research and capacity building. That's our agenda. Uh, Chapal is here from the World Health Organization. There's a global cooperation on assistive health technology. Health was added in because World Health Organization is the domain, its domain is health. Uh, it has some interesting advantage if you throw health in there. Um, we can talk about that if you want to catch me sometime during one of the breaks. But uh, um, it's, it's tied into the UN Convention on, on Rights of Persons with Disabilities and multiple stakeholders, but the idea is and if you can connect, I put the, the link down there if you want to connect to the gate community and be part of this worldwide community, is that if we can get people working together, we can do one thing. I think one of the most significant outcomes that could come from this is the, the uh, World Health Organization has a, a list of essential medications. And essentially, almost no country in the world would dare not to provide those essential medications. There's another list that World Health Organization of essential immunizations. What we need is, a li a, we need a WHO list of essential assistive technologies or assist assistive health technologies. So they could say these, every country needs to provide these to their citizens. And this is something that we're trying to work through on gate. And of course, along goes that was how do you, what are the essential services that need to be provided so that those technologies are available and people are given the proper services and supports. And then it's all research-based or evidence-based. And design does make a difference. This is just a very simple example of this gentleman in the Olympco chair, you can see, I think to all of you, I'm pretty obvious that that's not an appropriate chair. Give him, give him an appropriate chair. He'd never done a wheelie before, never hopped a curb before. This was all done within a few hours. So if you want to learn more, 
Uh, there's a group of us that you can be available at coffee breaks and uh, today and, and tomorrow and Saturday. But most important is um, let's get connected. We'll lose ISWP as a way to connect. Mary said, I can't leave until 1,000 of you sign up. So pull out your smartphones and get, uh, get LinkedIn uh, through one of these mechanisms. And thank you very much. Great, thank you, Rory. Save questions. What's that? Save questions for the end. Yeah, we'll save questions for the end. Switch laptops. Yep, we'll switch laptops here. Give us a moment. Hello, hello, can you hear me? No, there we go, all right. Thank you, Dr. Cooper, fabulous presentation. We look forward to talking to you more in the next couple of days. Um, while we're switching over computers, I am also proud to introduce um, Dr. Michael Boninger. Dr. Boninger is a professor and endowed chair in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and director of UPMC, which is the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center Rehabilitation Institute. Dr. Boninger is a physician researcher for the Department of Veterans Affairs and has an extensive publication record of well over 200 papers that include a focus on spinal cord injury and assistive technology. Dr. Boninger has won numerous awards, including being elected to the Institute of Medicine in 2013. Congratulations. Welcome, Dr. Boninger. Thank, thank you. So a um, uh, quick outline, uh, I'll go through a disclaimer, some background. Uh, I'm gonna talk about two areas of uh, um, kind of breakthroughs uh, um, at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, and then focus on the third area, also from Pittsburgh, on brain-computer interfaces. And then, um, you know, part of what Mark asked me to talk about was the future of assistive technology. When you get enough gray hair, like Rory and I have, you get to start talking, well, all of our speakers, um, we get to start talking about the future of assistive technology, and so how is brain-computer interfaces going to impact uh, the wheelchair as part of the discussion. So from a disclaimer, I have no, um, uh, I do no consulting, uh, there'll be, I do get patent royalties, but they won't be discussed. Um, the main disclaimer is that this is a relatively department-centric uh, talk. It, it's from, uh, most of it's from my department. Mark and I were talking yesterday, and it turns out that uh, it's been about 13 years, I think, since I came to an international seating symposium. Amazing differences, right? So the room is clearly much bigger. What shocks me the most is that I am the person up here who's not wearing a tie. Uh, it used to be a really kind of an informal thing. Uh, I'm gonna start a campaign to switch it back. Um, 13 years ago, George Bush was talking about the need to invade Iraq, just to put things in a time perspective. Um, uh, because there are weapons of mass destruction present. And 13 years ago, the only research I did was wheelchair research. And just keep that in context, it would still be the majority of the research that I do. Um, if, I, if I listed my professional accomplishments, um, my, my number one accomplishment I'll tell you about at the end professionally, number two uh, would be the work done in wheelchairs. Number three would be the brain-computer interface work that you're gonna hear about. So uh, that, that's a, a perspective that, that you should have. You know, one of, the, one of the areas where there's been amazing breakthrough is in stem cells. Uh, how, how amazing the breakthroughs are, what that means is an interesting thing to talk about, um, but uh, some work, there, there's a, a relatively new field uh, that is, is being you know, uh, promoted, which is regenerative rehabilitation. And what it is is this intersection between regenerative medicine and rehabilitation, uh, and what we believe is that this is going to lead to improved outcomes. So there are some graphs here. This is Fabrizio Ambrosio. She's a member of the department of my department uh, and a physical therapist. And and what she's shown, some stem cells, especially muscle-derived stem cells, have actually not lived up to their promise. 
Uh, the thought was that they could cure muscular dystrophy. You inject them into the muscle, uh, and, and they would not convert into, uh, into muscle cells. And what Fabi uh, uh, started to, to promote was maybe what we're doing wrong is after you inject them into the muscles, you're resting the person. And for the therapists in the room, rest, you know, we all know that bed rest is a thing of the past. So in, in these slides, what this is just showing is at a, at a physiologic dose of neuromuscular electrical stimulation similar to exercise, if you inject stem cells into a muscular dystrophy model of a mouse, that you get this increased production of viable stem cells that lead to increased force production. I'm not sure that the fluorescence of the dystrophin positive cells shows very well. But again, this intersection. So now if you inject this and you exercise, there's the mechanobiology of the cell, and that actually then leads to the cells becoming viable parts of the tissue. We'll get back to that a little bit later. We translated this kind of immediately into human subjects testing. Uh, Stephen Badlack and Peter Rubin at the University of Pittsburgh were testing this fiber, this fibrous tissue here. It's an acellularized matrix for uh, treating muscle loss, as you'd see in, uh, in uh, veterans coming back from some of the conflicts. I don't know how well you can see this, but there's this thin strip here where there's supposed to be a muscle. We implanted this tissue why did Fabi and I get involved in this? Because again, what they found is if you casted the, the, the animals when you implant the tissue, nothing happens. And by accident, the dog kind of ran around once that they used the dog model and they realized there was this amazing response. So the day after surgery, uh, Fabrizia is in the room exercising the patient and you can see this new muscle here in this strand right here. This is all new muscle and we see new force production. So the stem cells, exercise, increase function. Another area that, that, that is uh, kind of combining everything that you're hearing about are the gene projects. So uh, what, you know, looking at people's genetic profiles, looking at other aspects, biomarkers, and how that's gonna impact rehabilitation. And Amy Wagner is looking at this from a brain injury perspective uh, and, and has, has kind of coined the term rehabilomics. Uh, and this is the intersection of genetics, uh, genomics, proteomics, all of these different areas of looking at the human body in a way that allows us to differentiate how treatment should occur. So we understand how genetics inter interfaces with treatment. If you look at this slide, one thing that happens after brain injury is you have to worry about people having a, a, a seizure, epilepsy. And the hard part is that the, the medications that we give to people to prevent seizures also prevent cognitive recovery. So you don't want to give everybody anti-seizure medications. If you do, then you're snowing people inappropriately. Well, uh, an interesting story on how this is found out, the, the, they were doing an experiment with mice, some knockout mice, and found that when you hit this certain mouse with this certain genetic deficit that was pre-programmed, that the mice died. They didn't have a seizure, they, they didn't survive their head injury. So Amy then looked at a, a, a human population and said, look, let's look at this specific gene and see if in a human population that, that gene predicts anything. The mice died of a seizure, and what she found was that the, the, there was, you could predict the risk of post-traumatic seizures um, by looking at specific genes. So based on uh, different genotypes, up to if you have these three genetic um, polymorphisms, if you have these three different gene encoding, you are much more likely, 80% likely, to have post-traumatic epilepsy, whereas if you have none of these, you have a very small chance of it. So we can start titrating our treatment. This shows the blue line here is how well we can predict just based on injury severity and personal characteristics, not very good. The red line shows what happens if you add in the genetic component, and we can actually look at outcomes. This is outcomes from traumatic brain injury. Again, the blue line here is showing you what the, how we can predict the outcomes based on the severity of the CT scores, how old the patient is. If you add in these specific uh, genetic information, you can increase that prediction, and all of this genetic information is around dopamine and depressive symptoms, and we know that after brain injury, depression is a huge problem. So these are two ways. 
where you know, uh, breakthroughs in medicine are impacting the patients that we all treat every day. So to step into the brain-computer interface realm for a second, let me just go through some relatively simple definitions for you and, and kind of what an idealized brain-computer interface would look like. So what you see here is, is a person with a prosthetic limb. They're looking and typing at a computer screen uh, with, with, with one hand, but they're actually holding a Starbucks cup, the important cup of coffee for all researchers and clinicians. Uh, and they're able to sense that they have the cup of coffee. They're getting sensory feedback that tells them they're holding the cup, they're controlling the limb motorically. Um, and, and, you know, again, a couple of different concepts here. Um, one is, the, the, is motor control. So we're going to talk about degrees of freedom uh, this morning. So one degree of freedom would be the ability to control along a line, move back and forth. Two, two degrees of freedom would be you could move back and forth in both the X and Y dimension. So now you can actually move a, 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 a cursor on a computer screen. With three degrees of freedom, you can reach for things in space. You have an X, Y, Z coordinate you can reach for. With additional degrees of freedom, seven degrees of freedom, you can then control your wrist, pronation, supination, uh, and grasp uh, radial and ulnar deviation. Uh, and, and greater degrees of freedom would actually give you hand control. 14 degrees of freedom is what we've calculated out is probably about what you need to be able to fully control an arm. The um, in-brain-computer interface work, people who have tried to implant a, a chip into the brain, like I'll be telling you about, have got about two and a half degrees of freedom control prior to some of the work that you're about to see. So they could move in a constrained environment in two-dimensional space, and once they got there, freeze an arm and grasp. So keep that in mind. Critical to all of this is the decoder. So you have that chip in the brain or in, the, in, or in a part of the peripheral nervous system. It's looking at the electrical signal and trying to decode intent. And that is what the, you know, the, that's the backbone behind how a BCI works. So I'll start in the sensory end. This is Doug Weber and Rob Gaunt who, uh, who work in the department. And one of their thoughts was that if you look at the dorsal root ganglion, and as you know, that's where just outside of the spinal cord, there is a pure sensory component of, of nerve where we could tap into that sensory component and see if we can't derive sensation. So what they did um, was they put a electrode in the dorsal root ganglion of a cat, and I hope that you can see this that this is projecting all right, I think it is. What you see is this bar, these lines, this is them predicting where the cat's leg is. So um, proprioception, the ability to know where your arm is in space, and we'll be talking about this more, is absolutely critical control. If you don't have proprioception, you can't walk without looking at your legs. So what we want to be able to do, again, is know that we're holding the coffee cup and know where. So what the video shows is our prediction of proprioception based on decoding the signal from the dorsal root ganglion. And you'll actually hear the firing of the electrodes in the background. Maybe you won't hear the firing of the electrodes in the background. But you can see there's the, I hope we get the volume fixed <laughs> for the next part. Um, so you can see how tracking along we can predict proprioception. Further, if you look at, um, uh, in, in this particular experiment, we, uh, we, again, with the cat with an electrode in the dorsal root ganglion, you can see um, what, what's happening in the video here is uh, the cat, the platform is vibrating, and the cat withdraws their legs, and we record the signal. Um, and every single one of the, the squares there is we record the signal and we put a red box around a square where we recorded a signal from a nerve unit, from a, one of the sensory cells. I'm trying to get my, my cursor here. Uh, and what we found is then that we, if you went and stimulated each one of these cells, right? So th these are, there's, um, as you can see, there's about 30 different places where we're recording and stimulating. If you stimulate those cells, the same one that caused those withdrawal responses from the vibration, you stimulate those cells and the cat withdraws. So not only can we then decode what is the cat feeling, this vibration, but we can actually understand the control behind that. 
So this maps, and we firmly believe that we'll then be able to take these sensory signals and inject them back into the nervous system and provide this level of control. Uh, and we just received a large uh, grant from DARPA to do that work. On the motor side, um, I, I need to talk about Andy Schwartz, who's a researcher at the University of Pittsburgh. He's a basic scientist. Um, and, and, you know, when people used to think about how the brain worked, you, you know there's that motor strip in the brain. Uh, it, in the motor strip in the brain, the, the, there's a, a firing, and you saw this kind of one spark. Actually, I'm going to go back, if I can, um, and play that again. There's this one little spark in the brain, um, and that one little spark in the brain causes the arm to jerk up. Right? And that's not at all how it works, it turns out. What really happens is that you have a thought and literally millions of your neurons fire. And fire in a way that is directionally tuned. So you see that the arm is actually going in a circle. It turns out where, which direction and the speed you're traveling in varies the firing rate of the different neurons in the brain. And that's the key to the decoder that we programmed for these experiments. So Jen Collinger, another faculty in the department, uh, um, at, at led these experiments. What you see here uh, is the electrode grid that we put in here. So this is uh, 100 tiny pins, a millimeter and a half long. The entire chip is what's at the end here, right? And there's a penny for comparison. This part, this wire then sticks out and this port is actually just attached to the skull. So the only thing that's coming through the skull is this very thin wire here. We did fMRI studies so that we knew where, the, uh, where we wanted to plant the electrodes. This is the motor cortex. There's a central sulcus right there. And here's where the two electrodes went in. Uh, and we found a 52-year-old woman with tetraplegia who was willing to volunteer for the experiment. This is what the neural signals look like that we record from the cells. So you can actually see this depolarization. If you're used to looking at this, it looks just like a muscle cell depolarizing or a nerve cell depolarizing. What we did to train, the, the, to train Jan, that's the subject's name, was we just had her watch an arm move. She's completely paralyzed, can't move her arm at all. We had her watch this robotic arm that was provided to us by Johns Hopkins, the applied physics lab, watch it move through space while we recorded the electrical signals. Turns out that when I move my hand, I'm, this is power tripping right here, when I move my hand like this, there are nerve cells in your brains that are firing that are actually similar to what would fire if you moved your own arms. So she watches this robotic arm move. The next time, she, we're actually having her take partial control of the robotic arm. So she then is, is we didn't even tell her this, we just, the arm's gonna move, here's a target we want you to reach for, and the targets are there even when she has no control. And then we, we, we refine that decoder, and then the next time, move on your own. We uh, um, did this experiment, the, uh, again, the, uh, reminding you that two and a half degrees of freedom control was achieved after about four and a half years. At three months, we were able to achieve seven degree of freedom control. So what does that look like? Actually, I love this picture right here because you can all see the all important wheelchair controller here in the corner. Um, so she's sitting over here, uh, and, and uh, um, I'll hit this. We uh, consulted with a colleague uh, in occupational therapy about what the best one-arm functional test there was, and she said it was the ARAT. So we got that. The, the, this Jan is now controlling this arm purely through her own thoughts. There are seven degrees of freedom. So she's actually moving the wrist, grasping with her hand. Uh, and, and she had a, I think that you get one point on the ARAT, uh, it, for just sitting there. Uh, a meaningful difference is I think somewhere around five and, and obviously her ARAT score was as low as it can be and improved by about 15 points to near normal speed for picking up these different objects. I, you know, as the, the PI on this study, um, there, there was uh, some nervous times, probably the most nervous time from my perspective um, was that we invited 60 minutes into the OR. So you might ask, what's a, a physiatrist doing in an OR? And that would be a very valid question. Um, I had you know, two critical roles, and, and I personally believe I worked harder than anybody else in the OR. Maybe our neurosurgeon worked a little bit har harder. My job was 
to, to press the little button that injected the chip, because that was outside the sterile field, so I was outside the sterile field. And my other job was to keep the 60 Minutes cameraman from uh, breaking the sterile field. So I'm like running around, and then I, you know, I have to not break it myself, so that was my job. I'm hoping the volume will work on this clip uh, from 60 Minutes. Five months after the surgery, we came back to see whether she would be able to control the robotic arm with nothing but her thoughts. They plugged her brain into the computer, and this is what we saw. I can move it up and straight down, and left and right and diagonally. I can close it and open it. And I can go forward and back. That is just the most astounding thing I've ever seen. Can we shake hands? Sure. No, really. Yeah. Like, come right over here? Yes, you come over okay. there. Okay. Let me grasp your hand there. There we go. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And I can do a fist bump if you'd like. <laughs> That's amazing. So, so uh, um, I'm standing outside of the room. I got to hang out with Scott Pelley this morning. That was kind of fun. Um, and I'm standing outside of the room. This is a guy, right, CBS News anchor, seen everything. He, like, comes bouncing out of the room. The, the most amazing thing they entitled the session breakthrough, we didn't, right? That was not in any way our doing. Each subject that has, contributed, that has been part of these experiments, we've said, what's your one goal? Um, and Jan had a goal. Uh, her goal was chocolate. Um, she wanted to feed herself chocolate. She hadn't done that in 14 years. We had this rule that the FDA said we had to keep the robotic arm away from Jan. Um, so we invite, and so she couldn't interact with it. So we invited the FDA to visit with us. Jan shook their hands, just like Scott Pelley. Uh, and then we submitted a modification to allow us to move the arm closer, which was remarkably approved in a very short period of time. Um, and Jan started to gain weight. <laughs> this is her first bite of chocolate. <laughs> so people started bringing in all kinds of chocolate. <laughs> to work on my laugh. Um, a little louder than I would have wanted it to be. I have to remember to turn the volume off at this point. Uh, um, so we switched oh, to a red pepper. <laughs> Just for, after seven degrees of freedom, what do you do next? You can do 10 degrees of freedom. Kind of uh, the uh, uh, insight into um, the life of a basic scientist, Andy, who's you know absolutely brilliant, uh, is that what, 10 degrees of freedom, we could start doing individual hand shaping. Uh, and we, one way that we started was just kind of looking at these two fingers. It turns out that it maps really well uh, to rock, paper, scissors. Uh, and so, we, and what, what you know, was most important is entertaining Jan as she did this work. Uh, and, so, and Andy didn't know how to play rock, paper, scissors. That's the basic scientist. One, she said we have to two, do the fist pumps. Three, six, seven, she tries to cheat, hold the paper, and yeah, tell she wins. Yeah, my paper was trying to cover his paper. <laughs> okay, ready? One, two, three, shoot, rock. And that 10 degree of free paper just came out a couple of, uh, uh, probably a month and a half ago with um, some nice press. Uh, you know, Jan has a, 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 a kind of a rare form of MS that left her um, completely paralyzed but pres preserved sensation. And, and that made for some amazing experimental possibilities. We talked about proprioception and the importance of that. So remember, the way we trained the decoder was Jan is looking at the arm, right? What we did then um, was, was then all of, all of the experiments, she had to have her arms open and look at, look, her eyes open and look at the arm. To control the arm, that's the feedback. It's this visual feedback. And the thought was, could she control an arm without that visual feedback? She had complete loss of motor, but she had normal proprioception. 
So we did this neat little experiment where we uh, blindfolded Jan and said, we want you to move this arm back and forth across this line, which for her was an unbelievably easy task. She starts off doing it. If you ask her what she's doing, she said, oh, I'm doing great. The arm's moving back and forth, and you can see it drifts over and over, right? Then what we did was, and this is sped up three times, then we had the investigator, Rob, get in there and move the arm back and forth. And immediately, she picks it up and has control of the arm again. So that showing the importance of this, showing that the, the algorithms that we're using to control the brain work with the sensory feedback, kind of critical. Of course, if you're mean, you try other experiments. So what would happen if we move Jan's arm opposite the direction that, that the robotic arm is moving with her eyes open? So this is our anti-proprioceptive experiment. So Rob is just moving the robot arm the wrong way, and Jan can't do anything completely frozen by this. The chips are, are all uh, in one hemisphere in the brain. Could you control two arms from a single hemisphere? This is two-dimensional control with each arm. Her job is to grab this box nice. and move it up and down. Very nice. A couple seconds. Where's Beautiful. Really nice. Uh-huh. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And, and, and then we decided just to kind of give people an insight. This is her wearing the Armeo power, which is an exoskeleton, moving her own arm through her own thoughts using the Armeo power, again, for the first time in 14 years. You feel more connected to it? And then, over time, here's one of the problems, the signal degraded, uh, and Jan lost some ability to control, so we partnered with uh, colleagues at, at CMU and the Robotics Institute. Uh, and what they have is computer vision programs, so we used a different robotic arm, and now what we did is we actually combined her control with computer vision. So this is Jan trying to pick up this block with a different robot, less degrees of freedom, and struggling with it. When you add computer assistance to the neural signal that we're decoding, which is what happens in the next slide, you can actually watch that there, there's a the vision module that CMU created, she's able to pick up the block. And she's able to break away from that, so she was able to control this, that she could stop the computer from reaching for things. Uh, and, and, and so we're now able to see this mixture of how you might be able to add computer intelligence to this control signal. Just uh, you know, in early acknowledgments, I think I mentioned most of the people, the team, important, you know, uh, Wei Wang is another researcher in the department. Elizabeth Tyler Cabarro is our neurosurgeon. Uh, these are our two subjects, the two, first two subjects who volunteered. We're up to four now, uh, and some really cool stuff is going to be coming out. Uh, um, and, 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 you know, without these volunteers and a lot of people's work, we wouldn't get there. You know, when the paper came out in Lancet, there was a little bit of a fight over authorship. Everyone wanted to be an author. <laughs> so we decided um, that, that I, and I got to be the bad guy, the other PI job. Um, and so we decided to publish a paper that really showed everybody who contributed. And this paper came out, and you can see all of the authors. This included the FDA. It included the PR people who, you know, guided the 60 Minutes cameraman away from us at critical times. Uh, and, and so a true collaborative effort. So just to piece this together and, and wrap it up a little bit, what, what do I think the future holds? Well, I think the future is going to be combining everything you heard about this morning. For a stroke, if you just put stem cells into a stroke, how do, you, how do, you, how do those cells know how to differentiate? Right? We have for muscles, we can exercise. Well, maybe what you need to do is combine a brain-computer interface with stem cells for stroke, and it's a temporary implant. And if you add in this genetic marker, you add in robotics, you add in exercise, I think there's amazing things that we can do in the future. You know, so the question becomes, what's the future of assistive technology? Now, actually, 
this is all assistive technology, so on some levels that seems silly, right? Uh, the, what the, you know, I think what everybody here is wondering about is what's the future of the wheelchair and what's my perspective on that? Um, you know, one is wheelchair control, and uh, you know, uh, Dr. Cooper just got his VA center renewed, and as part of that VA center with Dr. Collinger, um, we're going to look at wheelchair control as a possibility with the brain-computer interface. Uh, the, the, so we're going to look at that. You know, you can control many different things. Uh, but, and, and, and one of the things to recognize from a wheelchair industry perspective is everything we're doing is upper limb. The failure mode in the upper limb is the arm doesn't move like you want it to. With the legs, the failure mode is you fall. Uh, and, and so all of the hurdles that we have are, are going to have to be that much higher when what we're talking about is injuring the people we work with. So, you know, um, I have a rant. Uh, uh, um, and, and that you guys are welcome to come see my talk um, tomorrow, which is about is entitled "To Walk or Roll," um, is my rant related to the focus on ambulation and a harm it might be doing to our patients. Uh, co you come to the rant. Um, I, I, uh, it, it's uh, it, well, I, I don't know how many people can fit in the room, but the, the um, it, it, it's. Uh, um, I, it scares me. I think people are waiting on the cure. They're waiting on this technology. They're not learning the skills. And, and we have some data to prove that the, the harm that that might be doing. Uh, and, and so I, I am a passionate wheelchair researcher. This is cool stuff. But I, I'm, I'm worried about this waiting on the cure. Um, the, uh, the wheelchair is the single most enabling device any physician anywhere that can prescribe, any therapist can give. And, and, and I don't see that changing for a long time to come. I, I do think that these technologies hold hope. Uh, I, I have one last video for you, which is, um, we tried something unique with Jan, which was to um, uh, hook her up to a flight simulator and allow her to fly. So we, could we did the decoding training differently so that she's actually controlling pitch and yaw on a plane. Uh, and she loved this. This is her, it's, it's eight times speed, which is why it's jerky, but she's flying through the Grand Canyon, so she's controlling the plane. Once she learned how to control the plane, she started, you know, kind of enjoying it, um, flying into objects. So there's, uh, she would like to fly over a town, she'd pick the building um, she wanted to hit. Uh, so I can't show those videos, they seem wrong. I thank you. For those of you who don't know, um, my brothers are, are in this wheelchair industry too, and, and there was a rumor that all three of us were going to be together uh, to this time, but my uh, brother David is not here. Ron um, is here just to prove that we actually do exist in the same room and that we have families outside of our work. Uh, uh, Ron is here, um, and this is a brother, Dave. Uh, and um, it's been kind of a great thing that when I get to go to a conference with this every once in a while, I get to hand out with my family. Uh, I think we're going to do questions at the end. We'll do questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Boninger. Fantastic presentation. It is my honor to introduce our third and final keynote speaker for the morning. Simon Margolis is a RESNA certified assistive technology professional and seating and mobility specialist. His professional career spanning more than 35 years includes work in public and private sector of the orthotics and prosthetics and seating and wheeled mobility industries. Simon is a past president of RESNA. He is a founding member and past president of NARTS, which is the National Registry for Rehabilitation Suppliers, and is an executive committee member of NCART, which is the National Coalition of Assistive and Rehab Technology. He served as executive director of NARTS and as a surveyor for the Joint Commission. Welcome, Mr. Margolis. That's fine. That's okay.
Hello, everyone. Everybody take a stretch, OK? <laughs> take a minute, stand up, stretch, just whatever you want to do to feel a little bit more comfortable. That's fine like that. That's great. Thank you. I'm going to go out here for a minute and greet you up close and personal. OK. We're going to do calisthenics now. Like heck we are. <laughs> if I have to lead him. OK. When you're ready, take a seat, and we'll talk a little bit. I really like to get to know the people I'm talking to in the audience so I can figure out how many of you I can offend in the shortest period of time. So first, I'd like to ask for a show of hands to the people who are not from the United States. I want to welcome you. I will inadvertently probably offend some of you because of my cultural ineptitude. But I also want to apologize in advance because uh, my talk is a bit geocentric and deals with a lot of things that are going on in the United States. But I do believe that some of the concepts that we're going to talk about are, are universal. And uh, I hope that uh, I don't bore those folks who are not familiar with some of the US issues. Next, I'd like to find out who you are and how long you've been around the field. How many of you have been in the field of seating wheel mobility for less than five years. Welcome. You're the future of the industry, and I really look forward to you seeing you over and over again here. Five to 10 years. 10 to 15 years. Some of the people on the right side are waiting for 35 years so they can raise their hands. Now. OK, uh, 15 to 20. OK, and uh, 20 to 30. Holy Hannah. And more than 30. Proud. And proud of it. I guarantee you that the people in this room who have been around for a long time have gained a lot of knowledge and experience from being around. Now, I've been around for 35 years, and all I know I've become is a cynic. And that's, that's what happens when you've been around for a while. You become cynical. And I think the presentation that I'm going to share with you show, will show you some of that cynicism, but it is also a different way of thinking about who we are and what we do and what the future holds for all of us in the area of seating and wheel mobility. Oh, thank you. I'm going to go behind the counter. I'm going to hide back here. That's good. Thank you. OK. How many of you were at the International Seating Symposium in 1999? Good, so I can use the same jokes over and over again. Because <laughs> that's the, the last time I had the, the honor and the pleasure of, of keynoting the ISS. And the scary thing is that there's a whole lot about what I'm going to talk about that hasn't changed since 1999. And I think that's a significant problem that we're all going to have to come to grips with and figure out why. Is what, is it, what it is about us as individuals in this field who resist change. Would a lot of you say you resist change? I know I do. I certainly do. Uh, OK, let's see what we're going to talk about first. Well, I think we need the slides up. Very yeah, really good. Thank you. Uh, this is, is definitely unofficial and unsanctioned. And I want to put that disclaimer in so that Mark doesn't have a, a hissy fit when I show some of these things. <laughs> but, but this is the top 10 list of then and now. I want to sort of put some of the things about all of us into perspective. Now, this may not pertain to all of you, but I'm sure even those of you who wouldn't admit that it obtains, you know, pertains to them, that it probably does. Let's look at the first one. Then it was seeds and stems. And now it's roughage. <laughs> Number nine of the then and now, we were all looking for the perfect high. And now we're looking for the perfect high yield mutual fund. <laughs> the next one is your kid telling you, whatever. Well, where I am now, it's probably depends rather than whatever. <laughs> Number seven, 
is Peace Now. Do we all remember this era? How many of you are peaceniks? How many of you don't admit that you're peaceniks, right? Well, it was, then it was Peace Now, and now it's Lease Now. <laughs> Number six is passing the driver's test. That was one of the most exciting things in any of our lives, right? When we finally passed the test, finally got to drive. Now when I went to renew my license, I was concerned about passing the vision test. <laughs> so things have changed considerably. Number five is getting out to a hip new joint. Do you remember, you remember Studio 54? Okay, at least you're aware of Studio 54, right? Well, now it's getting a new hip joint. <laughs> Number four is a keg. Don't get ahead of me on them. You probably know what this one is. Now it's an EKG. <laughs> Number three is 50 kinds of movie treats. You got this one coming up? Now it's 50 shades of gray. <laughs> and number two is hoping for a BMW. Now we're hoping for a BM. <laughs> and number one on the den and now is long hair and longing for hair. I'm going to get serious eventually, but you know, it's, it's hard to get serious because one of the reasons I think I've survived so long in the field is I never took myself very seriously. I took what I do very seriously, but never individually. Well, let's start with this. This presentation is my opinion about things. I am not giving you facts. I am not quoting research as Dr. Cooper and Dr. Boninger do, but I'm telling you what I think about things and observations that I've made. So I will offend some of you at some point during this. So because of that, Mark insisted that I put up this legal disclaimer. So if you would all read this over quickly, then we can continue. So tell me when you're done. You agree? OK, we can go on then. First thing I want to do is tell you a story about the parable of the river. Now, there is no parable that doesn't work without a parable scroll. And this is my parable scroll. Actually, it's because I couldn't memorize the story, so I have a scroll. Once upon a time, in a village far, far away, people gathered for a picnic. As they shared food and conversation, someone noticed a baby in the river, struggling and crying. The baby was going to drown. Someone rushed to save the baby. Then they noticed another screaming baby in the river, and they pulled that baby out. Soon more babies were seen drowning in the river, and the townspeople were pulling them out as fast as they could. It took great effort, and they began to organize their activities in order to save the babies as they came down the river. As everyone else was busy in the rescue effort to save the babies, two of the townspeople started to run away along the shore of the river. Where are you going, shouted one of the rescuers. We need you here to help save these babies. They answered, we are going upstream to stop whoever is throwing them in. And I'll tell you, th that struck me so strongly in, in a lot of different ways. And I think I would like to share some of those feelings about that with you today. Well, what's the moral of the story? Clearly, we need to do our part in rescuing those babies found floating from the river. Well, what's the parable? What's the analogy here to this sort of thing? What's the, what's the, 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 why am I bringing this up to you? I'll get to that in a minute. The second part is, we also have to take the risk of raising our voices and asking why they're going, doing all these things to the poor babies. Why, in fact, are they doing it to us? And we'll talk about that in a minute. So let me bring up two things. We're going to have a, a dichotomy here between charity, in my mind, and system change in the other. Spending your effort and time pulling all those babies out of the river is the charity part of my discussion. You're giving something away, and I'll relate that to some of the things that we do also. And then the system change part, obviously, is changing the system. So charity for us, for me at least, generous actions or donations to aid the poor, ill, or helpless. And then system change is the shift in the way a community thinks about dealing with issues and, and how they will provide uh, deliver services to its citizens, both 
people with disabilities and without disabilities. Well, how many of you spend more time than you get paid for in providing service to the people you work with? Okay, that's my definition of charity. You're giving something away that you should be paid for. That's charity. System change, on the other hand, obviously, is where you have to move from that charitable work or that work of spending all this time working with, for the benefit of the individual patient, client, consumer, whatever your, your nomenclature is, to working for more as a systematic change in how things are done. And that's what Don Clayback was talking about this morning to you. He's talking about systems change. But on the other hand, how can we ignore the needs of these individuals that they have right now? And that was Dr. Bonner's waiting for the cure sort of thing. You, you, know, you can't wait for the cure, you gotta do something. So this is what my problem is. But I do believe that one of the problems that we had 15 years ago and the problems that we have now is we devalue our own worth in the process that we work in. We devalue it beyond recognition at times. And I believe that it, unless we, thank you, unless we change that attitude, we're not going to get anywhere. We're going to be the, the, uh, at the lower end of the, the health care ladder in a lot of ways. So in order to do system change, the first thing you have to do is have no more charity. Don't give it away. I never volunteered to do anything in my entire career that I used to get paid to do. I mean, I'd do other stuff, but I would not volunteer my time to do what I got paid to do on a regular basis because it devalued what I, who I was and what I was doing. The second one is just say no. You have to say no. And the third time is to spend your own time, effort, resources to be an agent of change, which means that you have to spend your money and your time to make changes. And in terms of the, the best possible role model for this kind of behavior is an individual that you've already had a chance to talk to this morning, and that's Jerry Dickerson. <laughs> Jerry is the master of saying no. And I mean that quite honestly. He has the ability to, to make it very clear that the only way that we're going to succeed is by valuing our services as to what they're worth. And uh, he's one of the people that I respect in this field more than anybody else because of his integrity. He's a pain in the butt a whole lot of the time, but that's part of who he is. And I think that that's an important thing. So if you want to talk to somebody about systems change in seating and wheel mobility, at least uh, in the area that Jerry's involved in, he can tell you some stories and give you some information and make sure you have a lot of time and buy him a beer. But Jerry, thank you. Thank you for all you do. I'm not going to embarrass anybody else in the audience, so we're finished with that. <laughs> yes, you, you are special. The, uh, I want to talk a little bit about advocacy, because I have a bit of a different view about advocacy than, than some of you might have. One who pleads or champions the cause of another. That's an advocate. You can be a self-advocate, you can be an advocate for other people. Well, I have a question that I ask myself. Given a finite amount of resources, does an advocate or advocacy effort deal with issues of rightness, fairness, and equality, or equity? If you're an advocate, say you work for an organization that advocates for diagnosis X, are you trying to say that your diagnosis is more important than the other diagnoses? If you are an organization like a Resna or an NCART or NARTS or any of the other ones in the field that are all sort of competing in a lot of ways for the same dollar, how do you deal with that? How do you, how do you understand it? And so I think that, that advocates have to realize that their cause is not as important as they may think it is to other people. I mean, a, a, a major, this hit me very strongly when we were, when I, I read all the information about the, uh, the uh, ice bucket challenge, and that there was a hundred and some odd million dollars collected for people with, with ALS. Well, the number of people with ALS reported in the United States is 36,000. So that 36,000 got $110 million worth of information. 
United Cerebral Palsy has almost four times that amount of people that they provide services for, but they didn't get any of that money. Why? Did MDA do a better job of, of positioning them, or did the ALS folks position themselves better to get the money? I don't know what the answer is, but there's something wrong with this system of, of, of advocacy and, and, and the way it works. Uh, there are people out there who absolutely are sure that the need for the asparagus growers of America to get a million dollars a year from Congress is just as important as funding complex rehab technology. And you will look at that and say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it sure makes sense to all those asparagus growers. So we have to be aware of that. You know, we're not alone in the world. Disability is not the, cent the center of, of the world's uh, uh, focus. Whether it should or should not be, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to make a value judgment. All I'm saying is, it's not. So we have to think about advocacy and how we're going to, going to deal with that. You know, how we allocate resources now and in the future is an important issue. Because there are two ways to look at how you make decisions about giving uh, uh, resources to people. The first one is comparative adjustment, uh, justice, which is pretty much sort of the way we do it now. You have an assessment of individual needs. You have looking at the urgency of the condition, how quickly they need something. And then the decisions about who or which populations are more deserving of limited health care resources. Okay, that's sort of what we're sort of what we're doing now, and it sort of works. It sort of works for general health care. I think it works pretty well. I just I just turned 65 and started up on Medicare, which if you really want to have a shock in your life, it was a big shock going from private insurance to Medicare. But Medicare is not bad for most everything that happens. I mean, Medicare is an anathema when we start talking about seating and wheel mobility and stuff like that. But it works. So you know. So this is the way we do it now. Well, do we want to move to something more like this? It's not based on the claims of particular people. The resources are distributed according to economic or social principles rather than individual needs. Uh, how, how much could these people contribute to society if they got the equipment that they need? How much could they do if they had the equipment? I don't have answers to this. I honestly can't tell you, but I know that these are two systems that are out there. The one we have now is marginally working, but not working well enough, I think, to really take us forward with the new uh, developments that both Rory and, and uh, Dr. Boninger have talked about. Because one of the things that I would imagine that every supplier and every manufacturer in the room looks like, says when Dr. Boninger shows a slide, says, what's the Medicare code for that product, you know? That just happens because we're not, if we're not going to get paid for it, we can't see possibly how we're ever going to get that kind of equipment into the mainstream. Uh, I'm not sure we will or we won't, but it's difficult. You know, and I think we, we, we do have, my, my crystal ball is very, very foggy, but you think the resources are going to increase or decrease or remain the same? I, I don't know, but whichever way they go, the system that we have in place and the ability of the people involved in the field to uh, control their own destiny requires that we change our behaviors. We change them significantly. And uh, I think that that's been difficult for, for all of us to, to want to do over the years. The next thing I want to talk about is the technology knowledge gap. It's gratuitous. That's why I didn't say anything about it. Here is an issue that I feel very strongly about that I'm not sure everybody will agree about me with, but this first part, our industry has made enormous strides in delivering technology to meet the needs of people we serve. I'm not sure we've made huge strides in developing new and different approaches to technology, but what we've done is we've got better ways of providing that technology. Manufacturers have, be, have uh, built more modular systems. We have more interchangeable equipment. It, the system is easier to deliver, easier to move forward. But I believe that 
we, don't ha we have not had corresponding advances in developing specialized pre-service education for the people who apply this technology. It just hasn't happened. Uh, if you look at 100 people who provide services in this field, you'll find people potentially with 100 different backgrounds. And what, are the, what do they have in common? A desire to serve people? Is that enough? I'm not sure. But is passing a test enough? And I am uh, AT and SMS certified through ESNA, and I'm not knocking the ATP or the M SMS program. I'm just asking if that is truly enough in order to assure some things that we need to. And I say that this both for the clinicians and suppliers, because the clinicians and suppliers who are in this room are the exception to the rule, because you're here. But the thousands of people who are providing powered wheelchair and other mobility devices with, with just an ATP background and don't have a whole lot of other education or experience, they may be doing a disservice to people. So I don't believe that, that the, the, the exam as it stands now is enough to, uh, to differentiate the people who can or, or should or shouldn't be doing the work that we all do. I think that there needs to be a formalized pre-service curriculum. It doesn't have to be from one institution. And yeah, three of you like the idea, huh? <laughs> and there's a wonderful example in the area of orthotics and prosthetics. We all, we all sort of want to compare ourselves to the OMP community because they've been very successful. Now, Medicare has got them on the radar also at this point, and, but that's another issue. You can't get certified as a BOC or an ABC certified orthotist prosthetist without taking a, an NCOPE, which is their association, uh, uh, coursework. And then you have to have, after the coursework, you have to have an internship, okay? I mean, that's very, very different than what we have. But we want to be treated the same as these people, but we don't want to pay the dues up front to do it. Now, can we actually do that or not? No. Continuing education is not enough. <laughs> I could get stoned for that saying that here, but it's not. It's not. You can't simply have 18 credits of continuing education and then take, for exam and take an exam and everybody feel really good about the fact that you're out there providing you know, thousands and thousands of dollars of equipment to people. It's not right, in my mind and not just prep courses for taking the exams. To me, that's the absolute worst possible route for people to take. They sit and take a prep exam. The next day, they take the test, and they remember just enough to pass the test. And I think that's not right. I, I, I've never agreed with that approach to people. You know, and, the, and I'm not talking about the Resna uh, assistive technology course. That's a different story. That's an educational program that sits independent of preparing for the test, even though I think many people feel if they take that course, they can pass the, pass the exam. Now, formalized pre-service education, is it realistic? Well, probably not, at least not right now, because the people who are, the amount of dollars that come out of the system in terms of profit for the companies that provide technology, uh, is not enough to put back into the system to, to get this pre-service education brought forward. Uh, just seeing how, how the reaction to the SMS as a, uh, as a non-mandatory credential, as the APT, ATP, the, the SMS numbers are not very high right now because there's no, no driving force. So is it realistic? It's probably not. But there are consequences, and the consequences is that we will be seen, and this is a terrible word, but our industry gets to be seen as bottom feeders. Because what has happened in the past is that there have been a bunch of com companies out there that we've been judged uh, on their example who are, or were, bottom feeders. So I think that there's a, uh, a significant risk for us. I think that what I want to leave you with is, is the, the, this feeling that I have that 
everybody in our industry is waiting for somebody else to lead, is waiting for somebody else to take that step out in front and be the ones who, who really make things happen. We belong to organizations, we pay our dues, and we say that's enough. That organization should be doing the work for us. And having been involved with President Resna and President Nartz and on the executive committee of NCART, I've seen that happen, and it happens with, all, with a, a lot of different organizations. We don't have the 2010 rule, we have the 199 rule. 1% 1 of the people in the industry do 99% of the work, and we just can't do it. It's not, there's not enough. So I'm gonna talk about the, you know, what I feel is the need for what you need to do, what we need to do in order to uh, change things around. We've gotta be the first fish to jump out of the fishbowl and jump into new waters. I think that the reality is that, that, and I'm going to read some of this to you, only because it's, it's important enough for me that I want you to see it and hear it both. The reality is that the, that the constant and the inconsistent professional world has changed. That's pretty reasonable. All we have is change that we can be absolutely certain of. Things are going to change. Tomorrow inevitably will be different than today. And with each dawn, we emerge into a new world a competitive world that forced us to adapt, keep up, or fail. How many people thought 10 years ago that their seating clinics wouldn't be around anymore? We all know people whose seating clinics haven't been around. We all know very, very good suppliers whose companies aren't viable. We know manufacturers who, have, who aren't around anymore. And there's been consolidation, and there's been buyouts, and all sorts of things like that. But change is, is our reality. As we watch the panorama of change pass before us, some of us will see more than others. Some of us have the vision. Some of us will have better depth perception. We'll be able to see how things are going to change and which way we need to move. And some of us will scramble up to a better vantage point. Some of us want to take the higher ground and see what's going on. Seeing the future and where our profession fits is the chief responsibility of leaders. But I want to I want to emphasize that a leadership is not a position, but it's an activity. We have people who are elected as leaders, but everyone needs to be a leader. Everyone needs to get out in front of the problem. And if you don't, and the problem doesn't go away, hey guys, you're to blame. You can make changes. You will make changes if you try. Our industry and profession needs leaders with three attributes. We need 2020 foresight so we can see what's coming down the pike. We need 2020 hindsight so we can make sure that we won't make some of the same mistakes we made in the past. But what we really need is 2020 insight so that we understand what the problem is because we end up in our industry solving solutions that don't solve problems. And that's a difficulty. We work very hard at doing something and then by the time we finish doing it, there's another problem that's in the way. And here's the big one. I, I can hear you saying in the back of your minds, I don't have time to lead. Does that strike home with some of you? You're busier than you possibly can be. You have your home life, you have your work life, you have your community life. Well, time management, according to John Maxwell, is an oxymoron. You cannot manage time. Time is beyond our control and the clock keeps ticking regardless of how we lead our lives. Priority management is the answer to maximizing the time we have. And that's what I ask you to do. Adjust your priorities so that making systems changes in your working environment and not only concentrating about pulling the poor babies from the river. I think we can make a change for the, for the better and I think we can see uh, a change in the field in, in, in the next five, 10 or 15 years Hopefully I can come back then again and speak again. Here's my uh, email number, email address. So if you want to get contact me, hate mail is accepted. I do have search engines that can find you if you write nasty things about me. But anyway, thank you all for your time and have a great day. care of a couple things. Are there any questions for either Dr. Boninger or Simon 
Um, Rory's coming right back up here. Any of our three keynote speakers, if there are questions, um, I'm just looking if there's microphones in the audience. So if there are any questions up there, please stand up because it's really hard to see the sea of smiling faces out there. All right, I don't think I'm missing any. All three of these um, gentlemen will be around for the next couple of days. They're fantastic with hallway chatting, so um, please be sure to um, stop them and have additional conversations they're presenting again as well. Mark, you ready? Yep. I, I think I have the microphones here, but yeah, that's in front. Is that one working? Okay. So Simon, on behalf of the... Is that working? Is it working? Let's come up here. Yeah. Here we go. We can see him, see us. <laughs> yeah, Rory, Rory knows, knows protocol here. <laughs> Just move the flags around. Move the flags around. <laughs> so on, on behalf of the 31st International Seating Symposium, the University of Pittsburgh, and the, Depar and the Department of Rehab Science, Technology Agency. On behalf of ISS University and the Department of Rehab Science, we wanted to present you with an, an achievement award for your lifetime of excellence, you leadership, and dedication to the field of, of rehabilitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. They like having things there. Oh, 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 that went off just oh. Uh, we're not quite done with you yet, Simon. Um, as Mark has mentioned a few times, this is uh, the, we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Department of Rehabilitation Science and Technology, and in order to do that, we've uh, had some medallions created that we'll be presenting uh, today and tomorrow to a few individuals that we think have uh, contributed uh, to the mission of our department, um, either within our department or globally. And so I'd like to also present Simon with one of those. Good day, Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yes. Um, we'd like to recognize a few other people uh, because uh, they'll be leaving shortly that have, I, that I think, uh, or our department thinks have contributed significantly to, um, to wheelchairs and to assistive technology uh, in our mission of our department. So if we could have Rob Horvath Sue Idle and uh, Chapal Kasnabis come forward. Thank you, Rob. I'll, uh, I guess I'll let Rob. Uh, do the honor of presenting this to Sue since she's, she's went she went off to another meeting. Yes, please, and Chapal. So Rob is with uh, the U.S. Uh, Agency for International Development, and they've uh, spent nearly a hundred million dollars uh, investing in wheelchair uh, wheel creation of wheelchairs and service delivery around the world over the last 17 years. Uh, And Chapal is with the World Health Organization. You heard in my talk mention about the, the GATE Committee, and, and it, you saw those documents that are provided by the World Health Organization. And in 2008, Chapal led the effort for the guidelines of wheelchair, worldwide guidelines for wheelchair provision and wheelchair quality. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you.